Welcome back everyone. Uh, this is the third video in a series where we develop a custom environment for deep reinforcement learning as applied to portfolio optimization. Um, as this is the third video, it's highly recommended that you go back and watch the first two um, because if you haven't, there will be a lot of stuff that simply does not make sense. So in the last video, we did a sensitivity study where we kind of determined this was the best one for this particular application. Uh, it costs a full 30, or not 32, but point. 32 cents uh, per chain, uh, training job, which is pretty good. Uh, so now we're going to go in and we are going to do the tuning. Okay, and let me just first clear all the cells here and let's spin up a new job. Okay, so very similar to here before. Um, and let's just actually check that I got the right M5 large and M5 large. Excellent. So it's going to go through. Now we're going to pick the uh, CPU type and we are going to pick the instance type. So this was uh, dependent on the sensitivity study we did last time. Uh, even though the GPUs can be fantastic for a lot of machine learning and deep learning applications, for this particular job, because the model is fairly small, uh, it's actually a CPU intensive job. And in reinforcement learning in general, because there's a lot more overhead than you're just simply training a particular uh, neural network. Um, it's actually CPU uh, was the best one. So the hyperparameters, which were mentioned in the previous uh, videos, was in train.py. And here I've just spelled them out again. There's quite a number. There's the number of epochs, which is that's the thing that we kind of said here. So it is a hyperparameter, but it's something that we're not going to tune because it's not really driving the model per se. Um, but then there's another a bunch of other uh, particular um, hyperparameters that we have. So in particular, you know, this one is, it's a fully connected um, feed-forward neural net. So we got two layers. And so this is simply the number of nodes in your two um, layers of the neural net, the first layer and the second layer. Then we have, because, because of this particular um, reinforcement learning algorithm we have, it's actually an actor critic model. So there's two different agents that are being uh, trained and each of these have a different learning rate. And learning rate is a really, really important parameter um, the, this is the initial values that were set. And again, these values were actually um, uh, arrived at with a manual optimization. It's something I did uh, a year ago or so. I uh, played with these more than uh, longer than I would like to admit to get to a set of values that actually solves this uh, environment. When we get down to discount factor, this again in reinforcement learning, you have rewards, but obviously, you know, we always do a discount. Um, to make sure that uh, the rewards further in the future aren't as worth as much as the uh, rewards uh, right now. And then last, the tau and the sigma. Tau is, again, update parameters uh, that's very specific to this uh, reinforcement learning architecture. And then sigma, we have an, uh, a noise um, a function, which one of the big things in reinforcement learning is you kind of want to add a little bit of noise into your action space so you're not doing the same things. It gives it a little bit of exploration to it. So this is a function here that kind of adds, again, a little bit of noise into that uh, uh, training. So with that, we can set up our hyperparameter training. And so we haven't used all of them. We've kind of down-selected to these number of uh, hyperparameters. And you can have it as a cr uh, categorical list. So here, this is just, you know, the hyperparameter, the uh, algorithm that's going to sit on top of this can only choose these two values. Where when you have a continuous, it's continuous. Obviously, it's just a float anywhere between this min and the max value. And then you could also have an integer list, which we don't have here, but you could have a min and max, and it could just pick integer values between that. So we pick this. It's relatively close to these numbers that we have up here. Um, if I ran it and I found we were up against the limit, maybe want to come back and then try again with a different range, right? So this is definitely where there's a little bit of art left. Um, as to how big of a range you, you give it. Uh, ideally, you'd give it a huge range, but of course, if you do that, and ideally, you'd want these to be continuous. Here, I just kind of give it two values to limit the space, uh, but it would be great to give it more flexibility to try more values in between and more combinations. But obviously, your uh, design space that you're looking for, it just grows exponentially, right? So the more parameters you have and the more freedom you give it, uh, that space grows and grows and grows and requires more training jobs to kind of uh, find a good value. So a lot of times it's an in-between, right? And that's why I say there's a little bit of um, art left in here as to what uh, size you give to these ranges. The objective function is just a minimize. And this is, again, that training objective we mentioned previously. I showed it inside CloudWatch. Uh, this is something that train.py uh, down here right at the end that we mentioned. It gives, it prints out this a training objective. So I'm just going in there 
and I'm just doing a regular expression, I'm sorry, that pulls that out. And then I'm just compiling the environment. So this is just something that's going to be static for all of them, right? Gets the right image that we built previously, the CPU image. It creates a base estimator. So all of the jobs are going to have the same number. You know, these number of epochs are going to be the same for everything. And then there's the hyperparameter tuner. This is new. And this is kind of, again, where we give all those ranges, the max number of jobs, the number of parallel jobs again. So the great thing here is that once you start, you can launch 10 jobs and each job has a different set of hyperparameters. Uh, for if it's, and again, this is another thing where you have to trade cost versus time. Um, the most effective way to do this is to have a single uh, job, so not parallel, but you're kind of wasting time, right? So the algorithm allows you to have 10 in parallel. We'll run them in parallel. They're pretty cheap. You know, they're 0.3 cents um, per job, or I think it was 3 cents. So let's just go back here. What was it again? Yeah, 3 cents per job. So, you know, again, if you were really cheap, you may want to turn this max parallel jobs back to 1. Uh, but again, that's that's uh, 30 cents for a full uh, set of 10. Uh, we're going to be able to handle that. And then we just say fit. And so now when the fit uh, happens, it's not just fitting a single, it's fitting all of this. It's the whole tuner job. And an interesting thing, if we go back here, we saw the training jobs. And now you can see there's a whole suite of new training jobs set up. But there's also a hyperparameter job. And so that's what we've started here. You can see I've done a, a bunch in the past. And let's just open it up. So now you can see this hyperparameter job that has started, and in with it, it has a bunch of children. So it has spun up 10 jobs. You'll see as we go here now, you'll, you'll see more and more jobs go through, and you'll see the objectives values slowly starting to populate. So we'll come back to that once the job kind of uh, matures a bit. Uh, but for right now, I'm gonna hit pause and let some of the jobs finish. Um, and see how it evolves. And one of the maybe things we'll just jump in real quick uh, to get a head start is that the number of jobs again was 3,000. So let's just go back to train.py and we can see if it hits the max uh, number of episodes without actually you know solving. Remember a solved one was around 1,700 episodes for the manually optimized set of hyperparameters. But if you get all the way to 3,000 and your zero score, so it'd be 3,000 minus zero, plus the duration. So jobs that basically don't solve this, I'm expecting to see something over 3,000, right? And the duration is in minutes, so if it took 10 minutes, that's 100, so we expect it to be around 3,100 would be the objective. And then that would, 3,100 would decrease, and we're trying to minimize it if it solves it in less episodes. If when it solves it, the mean score should probably max out at around 0.5, but sometimes you might get a little bit above 0.5, so it gives a little bit of a boost there. And then the duration. If you happen to get there faster, you know, the same number of episodes and, you know, score, but your duration is uh, shorter, then that's something a little better, right? So that's basically the objective function. Once we get in and we start doing the portfolio optimization, this is definitely where we're going to change our objective, right? And this is the, the thing we're going to be tuning for. So let's just go back to here. And again, this job is going to run. It's actually going to take a fair, number, fair amount of time. So you can remember there's... Um, a max of 100 jobs, uh, 10 jobs in parallel. So you possibly have, you know, 10 serial jobs that you have to complete. So each job, you know, we're looking at definitely you know, an hour's worth of uh, training, if not more. Uh, it all depends on whether the jobs hit 3,000 or when they start to uh, finish earlier. Um, and also each job has overhead, right? It takes about four minutes to just start the job. So it's going to take a fair bit of time. So with that, I'm going to hit pause and come back once the uh, some of the jobs start finishing up. Okay, the job is still, um, the tune job is still running, but I thought I'd just jump back in here for a second to look at some of the jobs as they are running. And this is kind of important when you're doing a job to keep kind of keep an eye on things. Just, uh, I wouldn't let it run till the very end before looking to see if things are making sense or not. So we come back over into the SageMaker interface and pick the hyper tuning, hyper parameter tuning jobs here. And one of the things that I'm not a big fan of, the default number to show here is 10. So you got to go in and pick like 100 for the uh, page size. And if you go in again, it'll it'll default you back to 10. So it's a little bit annoying. But so here we can see a bunch of the jobs have finished. And as I mentioned, jobs that kind of hit the end where I'm expecting to see around um, an objective value of around 3,100. So let's just go in and have a quick look at this. Okay, so, 
And here it actually gives you all of the values. So let's just pull this over to the side. And let's go to tuning. So the, here's the default values. So you can see it's Ghanaian and it's varied. Um, so this one is 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5. Uh, the, the main thing here is that it change is the hidden size of the hidden layer. So on this one, the size of the hidden layer is 64 instead of being 128 and 32 instead of 64. Um, and then again, you know, so gamma has changed. The uh, learning rates have changed considerably uh, for the actor and critics. So you now you can see they're different. And uh, the tau and sigmas have also varied uh, slightly. So it's gone in. It's varied a bunch of the hyperparameter tuning uh, pieces. And if we look at, you know, we can just see the CPU utilization. But again, the thing that I really look at all the time is the logs, which punches over to CloudWatch. And we go into that log stream. And here we can see, as expected, it hit a 3,000, right? So that's certainly um, a, a very poor, and we can see the score. It really never picked up at all, right? It got to 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and just kind of beat around there. And it really didn't learn. So this, is def this set of hyperparameters Definitely not um, a very good uh, set. And you can see the training objective, as I mentioned, right at 3,100, right? Because you got 3,000 for that. Um, and then the minutes of training, right, times 10. And the objective value, which is very, very small, but still you multiply by um, 1,000 to give you, uh, get back a bit from the 11, from the 119 that it would be there normally. So anyways, I just want to show that really quick as an example of the... Um, uh, hyperparameter tuning jobs that we're looking at. So let's just go in there again. Sorry, I went all the way back out. Um, and see how it went back to 10? I know, pretty annoying. Both of these were no good. You could just, of course, hit this arrow. It goes to the next 10, but I like to see all of them. Um, but what is interesting is some of the jobs were really good, right? So here, this one is 590. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, it is also interesting that you can see that the execution time is uh, doesn't correlate very well, and that's really because of that setup. The good news is you're not charged for all of that. You're only charged for the compute time. So the time for it to actually spin up an instance, to go grab the um, Docker image, download it, spin that up, uh, does take a little bit of time. There's some overhead in here. But let's just go into the good count. And um, so let's just look and look at the logs again. Again, this is just something as it runs. I'm usually going in all the time, having a quick look. And so now you can see it's solved in like a, a, a thousand episodes. That was pretty good. Remember the manual tune one, which again, I spent a, an embarrassing amount of time trying to um, get that to solve. Uh, didn't solve until like 1700. So this is already much better than what my manually uh, tune was. And of course, a thousand. The reason why I got back to here is it subtracts a uh, thousand times the average score. So, you know, it's track 540. So that's why it's less than a thousand. Um, but again, uh, these jobs are continuing, and so that, as the jobs are finished, it looks at the objectives, looks at the valid the hyperparameters that are used, and from that, you know, like a regular optimization routine, it then selects the next set of hyperparameter tuning. Uh, you can actually go in and uh, tune the optimization routine that's running. So there are several op or, um, options, and if you go in here. Um, you can actually, not sensitivity, tuning. So at the bottom of the tuning, I have a number of uh, references. And here there's all kinds of information about the different type of hyper-tuning, hyper-parameter tuning algorithms that you can pick. I think the default is like a Bayesian inference or something like that. Um, and it's also why there's a little bit of, you know, it doesn't start every single time with the same set. There's a little bit of a stochastic nature to that optimization routine, uh, which is fine. And then there's also, of course, a bit of noise in here because you run the exact same set of hyperparameters over and over again, you'll get slightly different values. So there is a, a bit of variation that you'll get, but certainly we're seeing uh, much better than 1,700 already. Uh, that one's almost 1,000, which is you know simply fantastic. And uh, we'll let it go a little further and see how good um, the hyperparameter tuning can get. Okay, see you in a little sec. Okay, so we're back. It uh, was quite some wait, actually. Um, it's not quite finished, but I thought I'd start it up because we've just got a few jobs. And you can see here, remember we had 100 jobs total. So we've got 28 completed, and there's still, still two more running. 
Um, just a couple things I was looking at here is when you can look through the other tabs, uh, it's kind of nice, you know, we can see the um, uh, job description, you know, what we had, we had the M5, but more importantly, we can see the different metrics, time to solve, which was, that was the uh, regular expression that we had. We can look here and we can kind of see some of the, well, that's just the ones that we um, set, sorry, I was looking for. We can find here's the best uh, training job so far. So again, we can kind of see how things are, are evolving and see the value here. Now we're down to minus 66. Remember, we started at nearly 3,000, 3,100. Um, so we go back into the training jobs. And again, got to turn this over to 100 to see them all. We scroll through all the different jobs that we had. Again, at the beginning, we were starting around 31, a lot of 3,100s. Um, and then it starts to get a bit better. If you start now, we can see some negative values, and that's something where uh, you've managed to get uh, a really good score in a, in a quick amount of time. And we've just got a few more left to go. Wow, well, full 57 minutes for that one. It must be something that um, was wrong with the startup. You can see it even gave you a null. And we just, like I say, two more left to go it should be any time at all but in this while we're doing let's look for we can actually sort this by objective value so let's go into that one that was minus 66 that'll probably be the uh, the winner that's that's a pretty awesome um, we can see all the values that they had uh, looks pretty decent and in particular like I say what I want to look at is the logs Open up that log stream. And we can see that was pretty impressive, right? Uh, 300, less than 400 episodes. Again, when I manually tuned it, it was uh, nearly 1,700 or over 1,700. So this is a pretty awesome um, uh, training that you had. So we'll go back. And the tuning job is still going. So I'm just going to hit pause again for a few more seconds until this gets finished up. I was hoping, not, to be honest, that it... Uh, it finished while I was talking, but it will not. Again, just go in here. It's good to kind of know how to navigate around. See the last few jobs. Ah, this one's 34. One of those really long jobs every once in a while you get. Okay, with that, I'm just going to hit pause one more time. Hopefully, uh, when I come back, they'll all be done. Okay, so the tuning job is finally finished up. And we can see uh, this just as soon as it finishes up, it kind of spits out all of this uh, information back to you. And what we're going to do is go to the tuner, and you know, there's a function called best estimator. So you go grab that. That goes and grabs the best estimator or best model that was there. And I just grab all the hyperparameters and bring it back into this dictionary. Uh, it also kind of shows here the output from it, and you can see it very quickly in 390 episodes. Again, super fast. Uh, got the, um, uh, the environment solved. Never had an, a, a training objective of uh, nearly minus 80, which is again fantastic. Um, just for just for uh, comparison, we can see here I just printed out the uh, optimal hyperparameters to compare it to what we did originally, and so uh, it still picked the same hidden layer. Which again, I didn't have much options in the hidden layers when I passed it in. It was just uh, 64, 128, 32, basically smaller than what I initially had picked. Uh, so if I was going to do this again, I would probably try this on the upper side, since we know that the optimal is here. So maybe if we went with a slightly bigger one, we might be able to get something a little bit faster. So there we go. And we can see the learning rates. The learning rates changed a bit. Um, this one went down a fair bit, which is kind of expected. Uh, the batch size is the same. Buffer is the same. Uh, the gamma went up a bit. Uh, tau uh, went up a fair bit, seven times higher. And then the sigma went up a fair bit as well. So again, little tweaks to the hyperparameters, but that made a very, you know, a vast difference. Here we can see the results. We pulled back, and so uh, in 390 episodes, it solved it. And you can see here, you know, we very quickly started to get stuff, whereas the manually optimized one back in, you know, the 400, we didn't have anything, nowhere close to that. So it certainly took off a lot faster and uh, trained the environment very, very quickly. So you can see the benefits of the hypertuning hyperparameter tuning 
and the optimization that it does, instead of kind of manually going and tweaking with these numbers, what a lot of people will do, much better off to come bring it over to SageMaker. It'll do this. It kind of has in the back end all of its algorithms, and they're constantly tuning that, making it better, so that gets that uh, hyper hyperparameter tuning happens uh, faster and faster all the time. And again, it's uh, done in parallel. Probably wouldn't have went to full 100 um, episodes. It got pretty good pretty fast. Uh, this is still one of the later ones. But again, it, it probably got uh, down to a much better um, value in probably 50 uh, tries. So I uh, probably would have made that a little bit smaller. But still, um, a heck of a lot better than what I did manually. So this is just a recap. Uh, I went back through um, all these videos. And we started off with the CPU where we built our image, uh, the Docker image, and put it to the um, Elastic uh, Container Repository, or registry, I'm sorry. Uh, so then it can be pulled from uh, SageMaker to do its optimization, and we kind of just tested that. Did another build with the GPU. Then we finished off with a sensitivity, really tried to see then, you know, uh, what was the best set of our best instance to, to try, different types of instances available to us get that trade-off between speed and time. And that's where we picked off the uh, ML M5 large as the uh, instance to try. And then once we had that one, we could go in and do our hyperparameter tuning. So you can see why we want to do our sensitivity first. We had 100 runs. We certainly wouldn't want to do that 100 runs with one of these other instance types, which sure would have taken much, much longer and would have been much more costly. So again, this was a, um, a GPU, which originally you think might be fantastic. But in this particular case, this type of GPU uh, wasn't very good at all compared to a different type of GP here, the uh, G4 uh, DNs, which were much, much faster, uh, but much more expensive. So we went with something that was cheaper and fast, which is this little circle down here. Again, so that's how we do this with a uh, very simplistic type of um, uh, toy problem, uh, which was the tennis. Now we're going to go back and try this with a real, or not a real, but synthetic uh, stock data to try to build up a nice um, reinforcement learning package for portfolio optimization. Then once we get that for some very simple uh, synthetic data, we're going to add a little bit of complexity to the um, uh, stock history that we're making, the synthetic uh, stock history. And then, then we're going to finish up with actually using that real history uh, to use this algorithm for. So again, uh, thank you very much for joining me and uh, hopefully you see me in the next videos where we'll start to get into some synthetic uh, stock history and try to build the same sort of reinforcement learning algorithm. Thanks and have a good day.